I'm Miski Noor. And I'm Candice Montgomery. We are co-executive directors of Black Visions, a Black, queer, and trans-led organization building power within Black communities to dismantle systems of violence. I'm Solana Rice, the co-founder and co-executive director of Liberation in a Generation. We're thrilled to guest edit this edition of The Forge, an online journal on organizing strategy and practice. We'll be looking back at the uprisings last summer and the longer movement to defund and abolish the police and prison industrial complex. We're here today with Maurice Mo Mitchell, the national director of the Working Families Party, and Rakia Lumumba, the co-founder and executive director of the People's Advocacy Institute, which is building capacity for transformative justice movements in the South. We're talking about what co-governance means, the relationship between elected officials and movements, and how we build decision-making processes rooted in community. Listen in. Maurice and Rakia, thank you for joining us. Please tell us um, what is it that you envision um, as a future with community governance? What does that look like to you? For me, it is a, a world where our communities, our neighborhoods, our neighbors, ourselves, our family members, including our children, our elders, um, you know, our folks who are living um, disabled, our folks who are, um, who are currently in cages are no longer in cages, right? Um, and are able to actually engage in a process that is truly rooted and centered in community from the ground up around developing policies, budgets, practices, um, that we began to envision what does it mean to actually have not just representation in government, but actually have government that's coming from the people. And a very tangible example of that is, for example, like how do we envision even bigger, like what if there are, you know, community mayors, right? And everybody in your neighborhood gets to be mayor for a certain period of time, right? What does it look like for them that that to lead to larger community uh, citywide um, assemblies where each decision that is made based on budget, based on um, things that really determine the moral compass of how we support each other are actually made from a decision making process that is rooted in community and it's not and it may not look like the traditional voting mechanism, it may look like more rank style voting, it may look like consensus building, it may look like so many things that we just haven't taken the time to really build and envision. So I, the way that I look at traditional American politics, is very, it's very American in the sense that it's very entrepreneurial. It's like one day I wake up and I'm like, Mo Mitchell should be mayor. And then, you know, I, call a consultant. I'm like, hey, I think Mo Mitchell should be mayor. And, you know, we come up with a plan that involves them putting together some donors and maybe doing some testing to figure out what my, my issue agenda should be, right? And then I attract the people. And if we're successful at lining up the issues and the donors and the people, I get elected, right? And there's a lot of things that are problematic about how that happens. So what I'm interested in is flipping it. What happens if we start with the people and we create the democratic spaces for the people from the ground up to be able to create and develop and sharpen a people's agenda. And then that people's agenda, in order for it to be realized, requires the people to make electoral interventions. And then from the people, we decide who are the accountable folks who we are going to run for election so that they can advance the people's agenda, right? And in what particular post? We need a people's mayor. We need three more people's uh, accountable folks on the city council. We need a people's DA, all aligned with this vision, all aligned with this North Star, so that governance is not about the entrepreneurial or the career desires of an individual, it's about the collective desires of the people, right? Because we haven't seen that form of governance, most of us have not seen it, we equate governance with corruption. We equate governance with uh, top-down power. But if we seize control of the governance as, as the people, we, we could 
transform the relationship between government and the people. So, so to me, it's about flipping what has been a very personal um, sort of careerist uh, focus to something that is very much rooted and accountable to people. We can do that. And we have seen successes where that's happened, where the people who are running for office are playing a particular role in a larger people's fight, right? And, and there's an understanding and a respect of the, the various roles and lanes all of us are playing in order to achieve that North Star. And what Mo described, right, is like, what is, that's the process of our intervention right now, right? Like that's what intervention should look like. But as abolitionists, what does it look like to deconstruct those systems? What does it look like that the DA doesn't exist as a DA anymore? And we began to envision like a new legal system that's actually about accountability and um, uh, rehabilitation and restoration, right? And so, you know, we, 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 we have the vision, right? We know what we're building, toward. we know what we want, we know the feeling that we want, we know the accountability, we know that folks like Miriam Kaba and others and uh, uh, Ajaris and so many others, including many of you on here, are, are building those transformative systems. And so like, what does it look like for our governance to actually mirror that and follow that trajectory, right? And so I, I think, I'm, I'm just saying like, remember it's a step, it's a process. And our end can't be electing these people, even if they come from the people. Our end has to be deconstructing the very systems that exist to create what we need. Mm. So. Thank you so much for that, Rokia. And that really gets into our next question. So I'll maybe pass it to, to Mo first, and then you can add on anything else. Um, but I think you're speaking to it already. But like, how do we build towards that? And what's the pathway from here to there? You know, I think that people are really in this this place where they're wrestling with, like, how do we start to change the decisions, the strategies that we are prioritizing, that we're lifting up um, to actually get to a place of community governance, to actually get to a place of abolition. Um, but like you said, it's a it's a pathway so, or a tra transition. So, yeah, uh, Mo and then Rukia. Great question. So I like the systems focus. I want to stay there because I think one of the things that often happens in this conversation and in a lot of conversations, we toggle without being intentional from systems to individuals, from movements to personalities, and it throws off our analysis in ways where it just becomes incoherent. So let's just stay with systems and I'll, I'll explain why. Um, so one of the things that we tend to do, even with our cherished movement candidates, right? We sometimes, we do all this work, this movement work, that's really intensive, really expensive from the standpoint of our time, our labor, our money, our, our psychic energy in order to get somebody elected. And then we drop them off in city hall, like we're dropping them off at daycare. And then, and then um, when, when they do something or say something that we feel is misaligned with us, um, the way that we respond is often dismay or disappointment or, and, what I'm here to say is that individuals, even the best individuals, don't individually have the power to undo a system, right? So we should anticipate that the best amongst us in City Hall, as a city council person, as a mayor, whatever, will encounter these really tough contradictions. And it's our duty to make sure that they're engaging these contradictions with us as comrades, not alone right? Because no one person can transform a system. So to me, the work has to be about figuring out how that movement, that electoral movement transitions into governance and how we don't see our folks that we put into those positions as targets, but as comrades, right? And there's a tension there because there are limitations to what one can do at, in any legislative body, right? But to me, that's okay because we as a movement could express the full bound, the, the full boundless energy of our aspirations through other tactics other than legislation in a city council or something, right? And so we should just see this as a tool. Great. So we have a comrade on city council. They could do this, but we're clear that there are things that they can't do. Excellent. That's why we have comrades on the outside 
who are doing direct action. They could do this. So seeking to look at our movement as a system and, and as an ecosystem, right, I think is actually a good and healthy way to look at what movement accountable elected officials can and should do and what's appropriate for them. Constantly pushing the boundaries, but recognizing that they are part of a system and it's our job to make sure that they're not captured by that system. And if there's an interrelationship that needs to be there, if we're talking about co-governance, then we're in office and we need to deal with those contradictions that are often really uncomfortable, right? Um, we wanna do amazing transformative things, um, but especially black cities often don't have the resources, don't have the capital to do those things. And so when our folks get into office and seek to make the transformative happen, but don't have the capital, Many of our folks get disappointed and say like, yo, you've abandoned us. No, we actually have to figure out like and struggle around how we come up with a strategy to develop the capital and capacity to make these hard things happen, right? I mean, some of the things that I know happen in Mississippi, it's like home rule, right? Great, we got, we got a mayor, we got a city, but the state government is oppositional to our, pro pro uh, our progress and our project, right? So if we are sticking with our folks, then we all are wrestling with those contradictions together. We're not spectators on the outside just being like, oh, bad for you, homie, right? So if our folks are comrades, then we got to stay in that and deal with the contradictions of governance when we're still under capitalism, white supremacy, and we understand that there's larger interests that are seeking to, look, seeking to pounce on us. When, like, look, Tashara in, in St. Louis, look, there are people, like, just within a week, if you look at what she's done in a week, are you telling me that there will not be forces that are committed to ensuring that she fails? It's our job to be able to figure out how we insulate her and challenge her. Certainly we don't challenge our folks in a way that acknowledges the fact that those forces will be coming. I know, I love Maurice Mo Williams, like the truth, like everything. I have like nothing to add to that part of the conversation. Like this. Like, I just wish I could like grab you right now and just put you right here in front of like City Hall and just like broadcast like across the city. Yes, everything. with the invite, I'm ready, yeah. let's go. <laughs> like, uh, I mean, just everything. Um, the only thing I would add is that, you know, our job doesn't end as, as, as community members, as movement, but also our job is not to just flank our folks that are elected, but our job is also to, motivate our folks, our people, our neighbors, our community members, the very folks we're trying to organize to actually be involved year round in a process that is about their lives. And not in a intrusive way, not in an exhausting way, but in a way that feels like it's a part of our daily lives. And so we have to figure out how to do that, how to make it comfortable. We need to make sure that when we're talking about running someone for office, that they understand their role so that as they get in, they understand their accountability to us as well and accountability to the people and how that process will operate. You know, I agree with Mo that oftentimes we, we elect people and we haven't had those deep conversations around how, we're, how decision-making is gonna happen, right? We don't, we, it, it's already too late. Um, but then the other thing is like, we have to begin to also um, Think of structures that allow whole communities to be a part of the process. So one example is how are you involving community members in participatory development? So I'm going to get a little bit in the weeds because sometimes it takes to get in the weeds to actually like understand like the practical around what we're talking about. And so like, for example, in the city of Jackson, we have um, the people's assemblies. The assemblies over the years have forced government to be more inclusive of community. And so now the, the city is holding a, a um, development there. The city development plan is no longer reserved for this consultant group, right? That determines what the 20 year plan for the city is. It's actually being developed by residents through a whole process of surveying the city around resident input around what should our 20 year plan be. That's the first time in history that this city has done that, right? And that's important. Um, I think in, in you know, sh you know, tools like participatory budgeting is important and not just participatory budgeting in a sense that you get a pot of money to determine, 
but residents should have the opportunity to actually engage. When I say residents, all I mean is people who live in the place, right? Um, they should have the opportunity to literally be involved in the entire budget process, determining the priorities, determining all of that, right? And yes, that means that there are some components that will feel overwhelming and heavy and you can't change it, but why shouldn't people know about that? Why shouldn't people know that, you know, there are laws that prevent you from changing the salary of, of this particular department because of this, that, and the third? That's important. It gives people context to why things aren't happening, why people are upset. You know, so just like getting into the weeds, you know, we have to create ways for community at large to engage in the actual operation of the city that don't feel intrusive or overwhelming. So. Thank you both. And, I, you know, I think one thing that's really resonating for me is that what I hear is that this is expensive in that we need capital, we need time, we need space so that folks can get educated so that folks can make decisions that are representing, um, th that are really representing their interests, right? And that we need more infrastructure, right? And I'm, I'm curious, like, from your perspectives, what does this infrastructure look like? Um, Mo, you mentioned capital in order to build capacity, right? Because we don't want to drop folks off and just say, you're on your own, good luck. But that process of decision-making, knowing where all the ins and outs are, who really has power, who, what policies are actually driving these, these larger decisions, that takes time and effort from the outside and inside. I'm curious uh, from your perspective, what are the capacities that we need to build as a as movement infrastructure to support um, mm -hmm. community governance? I mean, the first thing is I think is that as community members, we have to understand that all of our um, resources are not going to come from the government, right? And we need to, at least not right now, not until we build the government we want to see. Right. And so we need to develop some self-sustaining and determined um, capital. And that includes capital that does not look like necessarily just money, but capital that looks like, you know, how do we collectively own the land? How do we collectively engage in business and uh, things to provide the resources that we need? Um, and so what does it look like when there's a gap um, in service or a gap in resource, how do we as community figure out how to fill it? An example of this is, you know, like in Jackson, our budget is only, our city budget is only about $350 million. That's like nothing, right? It's, it's a little more than that, but you know, and our, we don't have enough money to do anything, right? <laughs> like anything really real, right? And so what does it look like to really co-govern, meaning that you just don't rely on government to provide all the resources, but as community, you're also figuring out how do we help to provide for where there are gaps, right? And not with an incentive, incentive to just receive some benefit of additional resource from the city to ourselves, like additional capital, financial capital, right? You know, not, not move in like predatory developers do and offer a check during election time so that they can get a contract once the person becomes mayor. What does it look like to actually co-govern and actually have a community partner with city to build the resources that we need? Yeah, the one thing I want to say about like, because the language of co-governance gets, gets used a lot. And although the language might be, I guess, becoming more... Um, popular or something that that's used more for folks who are considering how to make this make this uh, work transformative. The concept is as old as as government, right? So, our the, the politicians have a lot of experience with co-governance, but it's generally co-governance with capital, right? It's generally co-governance with corporations, co-governance with the one percent, right? So, really, what we're talking about is releasing the um, what anchors the political cap class to the 1% and corporations 
and instead shifting the co-governance relationship to the people, right? And you know the capacities to do that. I think there's a there's a number of capacities. Everything that Rakia is right on said is right on, right? It's like um, how do we leverage the power of the people, right? How 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 are we leveraging government dollars so that we could unlock the unlimited power of the people, right? Like that's really I think an exciting way to think about it, right? Um, and look, we're never going to go dollar for dollar with capital. We just we're just not. So that that can't be our metric, right? Um, but we do need some resources. But what we know is that people, when aligned with a vision, the power is almost unending. So if we could figure out how government can play that role to incubate the ideas of people, the ingenuity of people on the grassroots, I couldn't agree with that more. The other thing I would say is um, that vision piece, well, that's ideology. So how are we leveraging the power of ideas and thinking of, of that as a key capacity or a key power to um, inspire people to be part of that, of that vision? How are we using political education on the most popular level so that people are transforming how they understand what's possible and what government can do? Um, and then also, how are we involving uh, intellectual labor, right? So let's just say if I get into office, let's do the, the mayor mo scenario, right? Great, I'm in office. Now, what do I do, right? Um, I don't have expertise everywhere, right? But when you're dealing with the municipal concerns of a city, you have to deal with everything. You have to deal with roads and sanitation and you know education and, uh, and you have to deal with uh, public safety. And um, I may not have expertise everywhere. And so how are we crowdsourcing the expertise of the people and um, also folks who have particular ex expertise because they've been hard in the paint for decades in our movement on these particular subject areas in order to provide support to movement accountable elected, elected officials. That is a capacity that's gonna be necessary because like I said before, they want us to fail, right? And, so, and, and look, we're, we're going to be imperfect, right? And, but what we need to do is mitigate um, the downsides by being able to lean on the expertise of folks who are part of movement accountable think tanks and other things that could provide us a roadmap um, or could provide model legislation or things like that, that give us the type of support that, you know, the right, the far right gets from Alec. The reason why there's like more than 200 anti-democratic bills all, they weren't, they weren't hard in the paint writing that legislation trying to, they weren't doing that. They just, they were able to, to get those ideas from a, a, a vast right-wing infrastructure that deliver those ideas throughout those legislatures. So we need to begin to build that muscle um, as our folks get into office and we wanna create a new relationship. Can I just drop in a little offering too of what I'm hearing from y'all? Cause I've also been using this as an opportunity to read philanthropy for Phil. Um, you know, in these moments, because I think that like what you all are also offering is this piece about like, yeah, we need resources, right? Like I was in a conversation with a, re um, a potential funder around supporting the Yes for Minneapolis campaign. She's like, yeah, but the way I'm going to be able to leverage resources is if you tell me a story of how this is going to set us up for next year, you know, and I'm like, yes, I get that. But like, how do we just build these infrastructures that it's like, it's always setting us up for the next thing and the next thing, like you were saying, Rukia. Um, and like, then how do we call folks with those resources? Cause we can't go toe to toe, but <laughs> we need some, right? Um, in a real way that is that is not just like, let's mobilize some black people around this election, but like, let's, build real structure and resources for folks to be de digging deep with Black folks about this election, about what's coming next year, whatever, so that it's not these like one-off one -off things and just wanted to lift that up because I also heard that in the conversation. And, you know, I hope some funders out there are listening and being like, oh, that's why we don't just fund in election cycles, right? Um, if we're actually interested in, in movement and community governance. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you know, philanthropy is the is the velvet glove of capitalism, right? So there's there's only so far it could possibly go, but we need to push it to its its to its limits. You know, like the the most elegant um, answer 
is just taxing them for all the money so that the resources can go directly to the people. And then we wouldn't need a philanthropic <laughs> sector, right? That's actually like the, the elegant sort of most common sense way of taking the money of the 1% and putting it to use for the people. But until, unless we get there, definitely we need to tra challenge folks who say they identify as being progressive or being, um, being interested in significant change, who their offering is money, right? We need to challenge them to think differently about what giving looks like. Um, and and the, 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 to me, it goes back to, to ideology actually, because on the far right, they've done a good job of doing the political education of their donor class. So their donor class is hyper ideological. So they're giving because they want, they actually deeply wanna achieve that vision. The, the challenge though, which is why we can't go dollar for dollar is that it's asymmetrical, right? Like their donor class actually benefits from their ideology, right? The, the donors who, who claim to, to be aligned with us, there's a material, this, this, there's a clear a material dis, uh, disadvantage to them when we win, right? But they, they actually have to be in it for that fight. But I, I couldn't agree with you more, Candace. The difference between no money and some money is a huge difference. And in order for us to be able to fuel any of this, we need some money. And we need to be like, we need to speak with our chest about that because like we, we can't be Pollyanna-ish about that. Like um, I can't feed my baby's belly on ideas. Well, a question we're asking everybody, you know, what is your vision for safety that would actually replace policing and imprisonment, um, especially in this world of community governance, right? Um, and in addition to that, really like, how do you keep visioning at the forefront of your work as well as like a, um, in addition to that. What does safety look like? For me, uh, safety looks like where we've created, there's no more DA, we're, we're to that point where we've, we've got our community-led governance, we've deconstructed all of these systems. Um, that North Star to me is where we have community folks, folks who live in that neighborhood, in that place, in places that have the ability, right, to, um, that we're all trained in mediation and de-escalation, right? That all of us are better equipped to handle conflict with one another because we have made it normal for children to get that service, to get those trainings in school. Um, we've made it normal for us to get those trainings in our workplaces, that we're just treating people, each other better. Right. I mean, I think that's important. And it's a part of the work that we don't talk about, which is that day to day work around how do we heal each? How do we heal ourselves and then work better with each other? Right. So that work that Bold is doing, that work that so many folks are doing, all organizations are centering that healing justice work. Right. We have to begin to put that at the center of some of our work at the center of it so that we can get to this place where safety is not just about um, uh, shifting modes of policing, but it's also, it's, it's actually about how do we shift how we deal with each other, ourselves, our inner self. So that's one thing. The other piece of it is, um, you know, where we look at safety as more than just safety from a violent harm, a physical harm, and look at safety in terms of what does our healthcare system look like? where we have a healthcare system that actually takes care of all of us in the most beautiful ways. That a three month old baby can go to the chiropractor regardless of what community they're living in or need. But they have that opportunity and regardless of the insurance they carry, right? That we look and we see and we look at safety as more than um, the physical and also into the housing, right, of our people ensuring that our folks have adequate housing, good housing, livable housing, safe housing, housing that feels good to live in and you're proud of, and that you didn't have to pay a dime for because we're collectively owning the land and you have the opportunity and right to have a house as a human being, right? It's about like, what do we, it's, it's, it's creating that space where we actually have, um, uh, the ability to ensure that we are all fed, that we are all taken care of, and that we are really engaging in what we call a more solidarity economy, where we're building institutions that actually foster um, 
uh, the, a system of share and caring, right? Where our economic gain is not our goal, but instead our mental, physical, and spiritual health is our goal. Um, and I think we can get there. I think many people are already there. I think we're just trapped oftentimes in what we know of capital right now because that's how we're taught at this moment in time to feel whole and healthy, right? As if we have enough money to be whole and healthy, right? And so I think we're moving and our people are moving. Our people are shifting from that mindset. When you talk to people right now and you talk about well, what does safety look like to you, the first thing they talk about is housing. The first thing they talk about is mental health services. The first thing they talk about is wellness, right? That's what they're talking about. And so I think we're moving with our folks. And as long as we're moving with what the majority of our folks are saying they need and want, then we'll see that the days of capitalism that controls our ability to actually live a good life will shift and change. Um, and so, yeah, that's a little bit of what I was thinking. Amen. Ashe. I I don't even want to corrupt that statement by any additions. I mean, I just feel like, yes, more of that. Um, I will attempt to make my contribution. Um, when you, like, when you said, uh, when you put a focus on healing, I think the thing that, that just was triggered in me is this idea that our traumas are unexamined and unhealed traumas have uh, a, a exponential impact and a perpetual life, right? Um, to, to our person, to our families, to our community. And conversely, our examined and healed traumas and um, our capacity to, to love and, and support one another also has an exponential impact and a perpetual life, right? So how do we um, create systems and create communities and invest in the ways that we could heal from the physical traumas, the psychic traumas, the emotional traumas? These things that we know will have a perpetual life, will have a generational impact, right? And then on the, on the flip side, how do we magnify our capacity to love one another, to show up for one another, to engage in mutual aid with one another? because we also know that that capacity has an exponential and perpetual impact. To me, when we've shifted from policing jails and prisons, those are the two questions that we come back to in community. One thing I really wanna uplift from what y'all shared around healing is that even in this conversation about governance, where we came to was healing, <laughs> right? Um, Cause we, uh, we mentioned earlier, we had a conversation um, with some of our teachers and homies, comrades over at Bold, and we were talking about um, what it, wh what our vision forward is, and, and what, how do we center inside of transformation, and how do we build sustainable organizations and movements. Um, and one of the things Prentice talked about is creating systems of care, which is what I also hear y'all speaking to, and that it comes. What does it what does it mean to create all of our our systems, all the ways that we are with each other, all of our institutions from a place of care and that I love what you offered Mo around like per, per, perpetuity, right, like that it just continues. Um, and that that there's unlimited possibility inside of that, because that is also the world in which that we say that we believe in and that we're trying to build towards. And so just thank y'all um, so much for that. And I'm going to invite Candice to ask our last question. So the last question that we've been asking everybody, and you can kind of um, answer it however it feels good, maybe in a couple of sentences, is what's being said but remains unheard? Wow. What's being said and remains unheard? Um, the generations of demands for Black people to be free, right? Um, it remains unheard. And what they try to do is gaslight us because we're saying it as clear as day and they're choosing to hear whatever they want to hear, right? So we're, we're saying it as, cl as clear as day and then they're choosing to hear like, oh, so we're going to set up a, uh, a, a commission so that we could study this problem. We didn't say that. Oh, we're going to change Aunt Jemima's name. We didn't say that. <laughs> we didn't, no, no, we're going to, no, all right, cool. We're going to propose that Lift Every Voice and Sing <laughs> is the, um, is sung in the beginning of an NFL, uh, trust me, no Black person 
marched on any street to demand that, right? So people are choosing to hear all types of things and choosing to, to avoid what we are, are saying as clear as day. So despite the fact that our movement has escalated in um, popularity, um, which has given us some uh, a useful sort of um, uh, leverage, right? Um, our targets and folks who are committed to the status quo, quo are insistent on not hearing. And we need to be clear, right? Like I was talking about this, that we have a clear destination that we always come back to, right? And like, even when it comes down to something as clear as defund the police, they'll be like, yeah, they say defund, but they don't really mean, no, we literally mean defund the police, right? Um, and so uh, people choose to focus on processes, like the fact that they're investigating the Minneapolis Police Department. Processes could go in any direction. We're focused on the outcome. And so I think this is a continual challenge with us, where the systems continue to insist on not hearing us, and we need to be resolute in continuing to, to yell out clearly what our demands are. Like, honestly, I echo what Mo just said. I mean, I think one, folks are choosing not to hear the truth of our pain, right? I was just watching a video um, that Jessica Caremore had shared that I think with Joy Reid must have shared um, on one of her shows where they're talking to um, some um, white folks in the South. I don't know where, I didn't see that part. Um, and they're, um, and these people are celebrating Confederate Day, like they're, they're Confederate heritage. And they go and they talk to them and they're talking and, and, and another white woman is asking them questions about, well, why are you doing this? Like, so, so tell us, tell me a little bit more about uh, what do you think people should know about the era of slavery and, and how your people contributed to it? And they're like, oh, well, what they should know is that not, not most, most people were taking care of their slaves. It's just like you would take care of a tractor. You wouldn't want that tractor to, to, to go bad or to be uncared for and so we made sure that our folks made sure that 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 these people were taken care of that they were fed we wouldn't want to hurt them because then they couldn't do the work and so then you know they go on to say oh and you know of course there were a few bad apples that were beating their slaves to death or cool or or mean but the majority of us were not like that you know um and and for me it is a lack of acknowledgement and a in a of, of the pain and the trauma that they have actually caused human beings right so it's a lot of unlearning and they i mean these are descendants repeating a story that they've heard over and over again from their grandparents their great grandparents so forth and so on um so there's a truth in our pain that people do not want to believe and they need to listen and hear and then the other piece is exactly what Mo said around solutions we are offering the solutions. Our people are clear about the solutions. It's time that y'all, that folks accept it, period. And that includes people who look just like us who are holding office, right? You know, the day of recognizing that it's just about the skin color is long gone. It's about what ideas are you seeing, right? Thank you for listening. For more conversations like this one, visit forgeorganizing.org. We'll see you on Twitter at Forge Organizing. For more information on Black Visions, visit blackvisionsmn.org or follow them on Twitter at blackvisionsmn. You can find more information on Liberation in a Generation at liberationinageneration.org or follow them on Twitter at Liberation In. Thank you to Nino Fernandez for post-production audio and editing. And thanks to all of you for listening. Take care and stay safe, everyone.